this side, I think. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the launch of uh, the Observatory of Public Attitudes to Migration. Before we begin, uh, just, I just want to in introduce uh, the panel and give you a sense of how we're going to do this. My name is Andrew Geddes. I'm the director of the Migration Policy Centre at the European University Institute in Florence. I'm joined by my colleague on my left, Dr. James Dennison, a research fellow working on the Observatory to uh, Public Attitudes to Migration. Uh, to his left, Bobby Duffy from Ipsos Mori. To my right, Liz Collett, the director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe. And uh, to her right, Jean-Christophe Dumont from the OECD. The idea of the event is we're going to spend some time explaining to you the observatory and how it works for about half an hour. We're going to then hand over to each of our panelists to speak for 10 or 15 minutes to uh, elaborate on some of the themes and raise some issues that can then be taken forward in discussion. So I'd like to welcome you all. I'd also like to welcome those who are following the event on the live stream. Uh, and before we begin, what I'd like to show is a, a short film that we've made about the observatory uh, and the resources that we have created, which I think can now be shown on the screen behind me. Thank you. So I hopefully that's given you some sense of what it is that we've created. What I wanted to do now was uh, uh, explain a little bit more about the project. I'll be talking with James uh, about uh, the observatory and what is available within the observatory. First of all, to explain who we are. Uh, we are from the European University Institute in Florence. Some of you may not be familiar with uh, the institute, but it's an international postgraduate and postdoctoral <coughs> institution involved in teaching and research. Uh, you'll see there's a bit of a festival of logos on this first slide. So you see the European in University Institute in yellow. You'll see the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, which is where we are based as the Migration Policy Center. We're one of the programs in the Robert Schumann Center. We're doing research on global migration and asylum. This is one of our projects. We have a number of projects, and we're very happy if you want to engage with any aspects of our work. You'll find full information on our website. Today, what we're talking about is the Observatory of Public Attitudes to Migration. And I'll just explain what this is all about. First of all, this is the beginning, not the end of a project. We're not here today to report on a project that has been done over the previous three or four years. This is a new resource that we have created which we are going to invest significant time and resources in over the coming years. This isn't something that we're going to you know, just report to you today and then leave on the web. This is something that was going to be updated continuously and developed as a resource. What we have at the European University Institute and within the Migration Policy Center is a capacity over years to develop this resource and hopefully develop collaborations around the material that we gather. Because as a, as a center, as a migration policy center, and as an institute in Florence, we want to share ideas, collaborate, cooperate, and develop resources together with partners also interested in these important questions. 
So on the, on the slide here, you'll see that I, we, we did a screenshot because we're very nervous about starting to navigate a website at a meeting and finding out that, you know, all the kind of technical problems that might happen. And so we, we would encourage you to look at the observatory. The short film gives you a sense of the data that we've gathered. We'll talk, at the, the data is gathered from sources which will be familiar, such as the European Social Survey, Eurobarometer, other sources of information. We're very grateful grateful to Ipsos, who've also shared data with us and have played a, a really important role in helping us to develop this project. So we're very, very grateful to Ipsos and very keen to acknowledge publicly that their support for the work that we've been able to do. Uh, I'd also would like to acknowledge the other people who've been involved in this project as well. Uh, I'm here today with James, uh, but there's another colleague as well who can't be with us, Teresa Tallo, who uh, played a fundamental role in developing this resource and has actually moved on to a new job opportunity and isn't able to be with us today. I'd like to acknowledge the work that Teresa has done. And also the film that you saw has absolutely nothing to do with me. I couldn't possibly do anything like that. So I'm very grateful for the people in the Schumann Centre, the communications team there, and also Giovanni Manetti in, uh, in the Migration Policy Centre who've done a phenomenal job in bringing this resource together. So please use the resource, engage with it. Please send us feedback, comments, or suggestions for how we might develop this work. So what I'm going to do now well, with James is just talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, and give some introduction to our early analysis that we are developing in the observatory. First of all, there's the question of, well, why develop an observatory? And I think for people in this room who have come along today, the answers might be self-evidently clear. We think there is a demand from policymakers, but also from the wider public for analysis of the causes of attitudes to migration. It's one of the key issues in, in European democracies. It's an important factor in elections. Uh, it can cause anxiety uh, amongst decision makers, uh, and which leads to our second point, where we think there is actually some evidence of some misunderstanding of public attitudes, the drivers of those attitudes, the structure and formation of attitudes to migration. And we would argue there's even, in some circumstances, a fear of the public, a fear of public attitudes, a fear of what attitudes to migration might be like and what they might lead to. Uh, and, I, and, and hopefully what we can do through this kind of analysis is develop a, a realistic picture of the structure and formation of attitudes to migration and their current shape across Europe. This observatory looks across Europe at all EU member states. We'd also want to make the point that sometimes attitudes to immigration are treated as though they are special, uh, as though they're not linked to other attitudes, to other political issues. And I think we'd make the point, and it's, uh, I think, decades of research on public opinion and public attitudes would substantiate this, that attitudes to immigration need to be understood in the same way to, as attitudes to other political issues are understood. Attitudes to immigration are not special in the sense that there's a different, there are different factors that influence those attitudes. We would argue that the, the way that they are structured and formed is very similar to other attitudes and very strongly influenced by people's early life experiences, such as education, higher education. And we will talk about that a little later, a little later in the presentation to explain what we mean by that. And also a, a final point there, in collaboration with I Ipsos Mori, we, what we want to do is create a go-to centre for pan-EU analysis that brings data and knowledge together. We can't do that on our own. EUI, we, we have great resources. We're very lucky at EUI that we have such great resources. But we depend on collaboration, and so we're very keen to talk with people here and a wider audience of people who may be interested in, in working with us. Now, to begin with, we, we, we wanted to share with you something that we think is uh, quite interesting in a way that illuminating certain important characteristics of current perceptions of attitudes to immigration. Now, this is a, from a document that we, we've been involved in talking to a lot of organisations and, and as we develop this resource. And we were involved in one collaboration where there was a briefing paper circulated and it was framed in, and this is, this is paraphrasing, we're certainly not going to re reveal who we were talking to, and, uh, but I think paraphrasing uh, the framing of a meeting to discuss attitudes to immigration, and, and I think some, perhaps what might be seen as common sense understandings of 
current perception, current attitudes and structure of attitudes to migration in Europe. This idea that Europeans are turning against immigration, well, that in itself is a, a rationale for an observatory of public attitudes. Is it true that Europeans are turning against Im immigration? The second point, in, in a sense, because of, so in a way there's a causal arrow there, flowing to increasingly negative media coverage. Now, we are not media experts. Our colleagues here from the International Centre for Migration Policy Development are involved in extensive research on media, and their publications are available outside the room. But I think the causal arrow we found a bit troubling, this strong emphasis given to media coverage, whereas we would suspect that there are more fundamental drivers of attitudes to migration and other political attitudes. And then another kind of implicit causal arrow, which is pushing people, voters, into the hands of the radical right. So three propositions there, each of which people in the room may think has some, some substance. That Europe, you know, maybe we, we need to think about whether Europeans are turning against immigration. We need to think about the role the media can play. And also there's the issue of the rise of the radical right. Uh, which is indisputably the case in some European countries. But we will be sceptical about some of the claims and sceptical about the lines of causation between those three propositions. And so that's what we would like to talk about first, is this first proposition that Europeans are turning against immigration. And what we use here is something called the European Social Survey, with which many of you may be familiar, looks at 19 countries, face-to-face -face interviews, seven waves, the first conducted in 2002, lots of questions on immigration, so there's plenty for us to work on here. A lot of the data from the European Social Survey is now within the observatory, so you can look in much more detail about European Social Survey data on attitudes. Because of the time span, it allows us to look at how attitudes are evolving, and we can also see differences between countries. If you look at that graph there, you might see that the distribution perhaps is not entirely surprising. Uh, asking about you know, whether people think that immigration has made their country a better or worse place to live, we see Scandinavian countries towards the top of the scale there, relatively favorable on immigration. And if you look from 2002, the yellow line, to 2014, the blue line, increases in favorability in Scandinavian countries. You might not be surprised to see towards at the bottom of the chart, uh, new member states in Central Europe, where attitudes are less favourable. So the distribution itself may not be surprising there. What might be perhaps more surprising is that in almost all countries, we see a shift which is more towards more positivity, well, uh, an assessment about the effects of migration which are more positive. Not a dramatic shift, but on this kind of core quality of life question, we see a shift towards more general favorability towards migration. So for some, that might be surprising because in some quarters, there's maybe this idea there's a tidal wave of anti-immigration sentiment sweeping across Europe. Well, this chart at least will give us some reason to perhaps be skeptical about that claim. Also, if you think about the magnitude, looking at this diagram and thinking about magnitude, in only, in only one country do we see a score over six on this 10-point scale where zero is worse and 10 is better, the effects of migration. That's in, in Sweden. In only one country do we see a score less than four, which is in the Czech Republic. The variation is not high. There's quite strong similarity and clustering around five on this scale. But if we think over time, we do see some variation over time, which is generally a trend towards more favorability not much, a little bit, but generally more favorability. So certainly this doesn't give us impression of any tidal wave of anti-immigration sentiment sweeping across Europe or alternatively you know, some kind of tidal wave of pro-immigration sentiment sweeping across Europe. But a general, you know, attitudes seem relatively clustered, uh, strong similarities, and over this 12-year period, a general increase in favorability. And what to to think about the bigger picture here, we don't see huge variation across countries. Uh, the, trend, the pattern we see is consistent across those countries. And what we would suggest is this is indicative of generational change uh, in Europe. People who, when younger, had different life experiences and think differently about immigration. So we think this kind of change over a 12-year period is indicative of, of, of gener generational change. But of course, you might look at this diagram and think, well, this is since 2014. And of course, something has happened since 2014. 
uh, the migration refugee crisis has happened. Very large inflows to Europe, intense media focus on migration. So what's the picture? The next slide, we look at that. And we would suggest that not even after the migration crisis do we see uh, dramatic changes in attitudes to, in this case, non-EU migration. So this data is using Euro, this data is from Eurobarometer. We've selected some countries from this data. Eurobarometer focuses on all EU member states. It's high quality, face-to-face -face data. The question is, an, is a kind of abstract question about favorability, a kind of gut reaction question where we might expect more variation in attitudes. But what we see in this graph is that most countries, uh, things don't change that much. Uh, and in many, there's actually a change in a more positive direction between 2014, which is the blue line, and 2017, which is the orange line. The patterns aren't even, but in some countries, we see an increase in positive attitudes to migration. Now, to ex so what is also noticeable is that in three countries, Romania, Poland, and Hungary, we see a steep decline in favorability and positive attitudes to migration. Uh, I think that's you know, ind indicative of uh, differences, important differences across the EU. Uh, if you look in the middle, the kind of, if you look at the European Union as a whole, uh, so the bigger picture for the EU as a whole, attitudes have not changed that much, and if anything, have become slightly more favourable, with an increase in thir 35 to 39 per cent of respondents with positive attitudes to non-EU migration. But of course, again, there's a, a third element of the proposition we talked about at the start, which is the rise of the radical right. So how do we explain this? It is a graph taken from The Economist, which is support in Europe for far-right parties. And in all countries with significant presence of far-right parties, except for Finland, we see a growth in support for those parties. So parties which are of, often at the core of their political message is opposition to immigration. So how, how do we explain this? Because we seem to be suggesting relative stability, if anything, slight increases in favorability, not evenly distributed across Europe, but certainly not necessarily supporting this proposition that Europeans are turning against immigration. But we can see an increase in support for far-right part, far -right parties. Well, we'd explain this by pointing to the identifying importance of issue salience. Issue salience is the people who identify immigration as one of the most important issues facing their country. So rather than kind of generalized concern, much more specific concern, people who focus on immigration as one of the most important issues facing their country. And in this next chart, we are able to look at the percentage of people saying immigration is one of the top two issues affecting my country. This is looking over the period between 2008 and 2017. I would emphasize two points here. The first of which, if we look towards the, the kind of left of the chart, the beginning of the chart in 2008, we can see that immigration is bubbling under as a political concern. The yellow line at the top is the UK, which is kind of interesting. Immigration certainly bubbling under as a, as a significant concern in the UK. The blue line that spikes is Germany, and the yellow line that rises up beneath it uh, towards the right of the chart in 2016 is Sweden. Uh, I realize it can be quite difficult to look at a chart, look at the lines. Uh, if anybody is interested, we're very happy to share this information with you. But just to give some indications of uh, the significance of this, we can see that in Germany, Im immigration is a key issue. And as we know, it's playing a, a, a role in the federal elections, upcoming federal elections. In Sweden, we see increased salience. And in Italy, with elections next year, we also see that immigration is becoming a very important issue in domestic political debate in Italy. Interestingly, in the UK, we see a decline in salience, perhaps because people in Britain have other things to worry about, uh, such as Brexit, and also maybe the concern in the UK is that there won't be enough immigrants in the future. So, yeah, but we would put, identify the importance of salience you know, and support for the radical right and uh, parties uh, would tend to be activated by people who are opposed to immigration and also see it as one of the most important issues facing their country, this activation of people who 
are predisposed to radical right parties because of their fundamental political values and also because of the salience of immigration, which I think points to the importance of what could be called individual variation. And I was going to hand over to James now, who's going to talk a little bit more about this variation at an individual level. Okay, thank you very much for kicking us off there, Andrew. Um, as Andrew says, attitudes to immigration in Europe are actually fairly stable, contrary to popular belief. Uh, people haven't changed their attitudes that much. Hopefully, uh, Bobby's presentation later won't be too contrary. To his findings from Ipsos won't be too contrary to that. Um, but what, what has really happened is that the Eastern enlargement and the migrant crisis more recently, these have led to historically high levels of immigration. These have activated the latent anti-immigration attitudes of around a third or even half the population, which have always been there. And that has led to uh, increased salience on immigration and an increased voting for the radical right. So from what Andrew said, we might think that actually all is rosy, all is stable. Uh, across Europe and nothing's really changing, that there is no variance and that there's nothing to study, actually, if everything's staying the same. Well, that's not exactly correct. And if we look at individual variation, so uh, the difference between individuals and their attitudes to immigration, we do see uh, a significant amount of variation, as shown here. Yet there is significant variation. So this is the European Social Survey again. This is perceived effects of immigration on the economy. Do you think it's good for the economy? Do you think it's bad for the economy? This is in 19 EU member states. And we can see that it's fairly evenly split. It's not that Europeans are all against immigration or all in favor of immigration. It's, it's a pretty much an even split. More people are positive than anti, we can see here. And the blue bars here are 2002, the, the orange bars here are 2015. And we can see actually more people have shifted towards positivity. And as Andrew says, the big reason for that is generational change, i.e. old people are dying, young people are coming into the electorate and they tend to be more positive. So there's nothing too alarmist here. There's nothing changing that radically. What we can see, actually, is that most people can make up their minds. Most people aren't in the middle. They can choose to be either anti or pro. However, very few are extremists. Very few say very positive. Very few say very negative. So people are generally, they have uh, nuanced, careful, measured views, either slightly negative, either slightly positive. And then there's a big chunk in the middle who are undecided, essentially. Neither negative nor positive effects, though that has gone down. We see a little, little bit of polarization as well. Uh, so a few more people negative and far more people positive. And just to flick through, this is just in the economy, just to flick through some of these other effects more briefly. On culture, whether you think that immigration enriches culture or undermines your national culture, we can see that actually Europeans are pretty positive, and they're actually becoming more positive uh, for during the last decade or so. And, uh, but this isn't the case for all effects on immigration. While uh, Europeans recognize that immigration tends to be good for the economy, you're simply adding more consumers and producers into the economy, uh, and they tend to see it as good for culture as well, it enriches culture. If we look at the effects on government accounts, so the fiscal effect of immigration, do immigrants take or give more to the, uh, in, in taxes and revenue, then we see that actually Europeans are a bit more negative. And uh, though less so than in 2002, even on this, they're becoming more positive. So we still see this generational change. Europeans coming through are more positive than ever. There's no big alarm, or as Andrew says, tidal wave against immigration, though they're a bit more negative on, in fiscal terms. So finally, the last one, where Europeans are far more negative, and this really highlights the fact that Europeans actually have fairly nuanced views on immigration. They're not too pro or anti two pro-immigration and anti-immigration blocks, people have, are able to separate on the issue. We see that Europeans actually think that immigration, the effects of immigration on crime is fairly negative. This is where they're most concerned. And this fits in with a lot of the other research, which I'll go on to. Even in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, the real true believers when it comes to immigration, very few say that they're very positive about the effects of immigration on crime here. So e even in those countries, they recognize or they think that immigration has a negative effect on crime and safety and security. So uh, that all begs the question, and I don't want to get too, uh, we'll try not to get too academic here and keep it in fairly uh, practical terms, but if there's so much variation in attitudes to immigration, it begs the question, where did these attitudes come from? And there are essentially four categories of explanations for why people become pro or anti-immigration. Psychological, socialization, attitudinal, and contextual. There's some debate around this, of course, but broadly, these are the three sort of categories of explanations. Four, sorry, categories of explanations. 
And in there, I'm not going to go through all these now, but you can see what you would intuitively expect in those groups for explaining why people become pro or anti-immigration. So psychological, the really fundamental stuff that you get from your early life, your personality types, your morals, your va uh, human values. Then into socialization, early life, so parents who use schooling, and then later life, whether you've lived abroad and if, if you have a history of immigration, that kind of thing. Attitudinal, so your left-right positioning, your other attitudes, which generally relate to immigration. And of course, your attitudes to immigration tend to be part of a broader attitudinal set, uh, as Andrew's already pointed out. And then finally, uh, contextual effects. So how many immigrants are in your neighborhood, uh, media influence, whether you have contacts with immigrants. So as I say, there's, we can see that there's no shortage of explanations on, uh, there's already no shortage of explanations for attitudes to immigration. And indeed, there have been hundreds and probably thousands of analyses and articles and research papers on why some people are pro and why some people are anti-immigration. And so, uh, this leads us again to why we why have an observatory like OPAM on public attitudes to immigration. And one reason is that there's just so much stuff out there. It's so scattered by country, by theoretical explanation, by all sorts of things. Uh, and of course, the tendency of social scientists to just pick one of these, run some tests and prove that, oh yes, this affects immigration without answering the big question of what causes immigration overall. So at OPAM, we want to bring these theoretical explanations together. And one way of doing this, again, without getting too techy, is, is thinking about it in terms of a funnel of causality. So at the left, in the bottom left here, you have distal effects. These are fundamental effects, so effects that are strong and stable, uh, big. Uh, they have big, in percentage terms, big effects on uh, how you see immigration. And then more proximally, the contextual short-term effects, so media influence, this kind of thing. These tend to be weaker in terms of the percentage impact, and they tend to be far less stable. So, and they tend to also, they're all interrelated. So the ones on the left tend to cause the ones on the right. Of course, there's some debate on the, some of the directions here, and this is just an abstraction. But we can see on the left here, the, 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 the bottom of the iceberg, so to speak, is your moral foundation, the stuff that happens really early in life, how you see the world, how you were brought up by your parents, the type of schooling you do. And this really affects your decisions later in life, your behaviors, and also your attitudes, uh, your attitudes as well. So it leads on to your political attitudes, and this leads on to the type of life you live. So whether you have even have contact with immigrants to start with, uh, the type of employment you go into, do you have economic competition with immigrants, the type of newspaper you read, so the media influence there. So these proximal, weak, and unstable effects on the right-hand side here, these are the ones that we often talk about. These are the ones that are very visible because uh, they are doing a lot of variation. They're changing a lot. They're quite erratic. But they're really changing at the margins. So they're the tip of the iceberg. We, uh, at, the, at OPAM, we want to also talk about the uh, more fundamental uh, drivers, things like values, things that are, are accounting for the big percentage terms of explaining the variation in attitudes to immigration. And as Andrew says, political attitudes moreover. And one thing we've done already is to take one of these from the left, so uh, human values here. So we've just started with human values. We've, we started this a few months ago. We've already done research on this. And human values, the idea is that uh, people uh, have certain values that are partially genetically determined uh, in terms of an in, in, in inheritance, in, in terms of random genetic variation, also partly from your early life experience, these kind of things. And these are equally distributed globally. So if you go to China, you're going to get a similar percentage of people with each of these as you would in the US or in Africa or wherever you go. And uh, these do a great job of explaining your attitudes and your political behavior. And so from our analyses, we, we did uh, scores and scores of analyses using these va values, different regression techniques, different econometric techniques, and we really find that it boils down to something very simple when it comes to human values, these 10 values here. Of the 10, I won't read them all out, only four really matter for your attitudes to immigration. And they are not benevolent. It's not that warm, nice-hearted people are pro-immigration or anti-immigration. It's not about power, so it's not think power also includes things worrying about getting rich and things. So it's not economic things so much in terms of values. It's really four. One of them makes you pro-immigration. That's universalism. That's the belief that uh, everyone across the world should be treated the same and that we should break down barriers. And then the other four values, your motivational goals in life, what you want from your own life and from society. The other three that make you um, anti-immigration are a concern with tradition, conformity, and security. 
And we've been very fortunate at Opam to work with um, some communication specialists, people who are working on how to communicate immigration and what's been done wrong so far. And our findings are really very similar to theirs. And uh, what they say is, look, the problem with all the messaging on immigration so far is, is that it's of, by, and for people who are universalists. So people who go into international organizations, people who go into NGOs, have these universalist values to start with, almost by definition. And so they tend to produce communications that say things like um, celebrate diversity, that, uh, and really saying that to an, to an anti-immigration person with these other values, celebrating diversity is essentially the worst thing you could possibly say because what they want from society is uh, homogeneity. They want conformity. They say that society only works if everyone's playing by the same rules. And uh, too much diversity will undermine that. They want to respect tradition. They say that, um, that that's one of their guiding principles. And above all, what they most care about, as we see from the other attitudes as well, is security. They say, do what you want with immigration, it's fine but nothing that makes us unsafe. We want stability, we want tranquility, we want harmony in society. So when they see pictures of uh, disorderly immigration, uh, this is the biggest turnoff that you can possibly imagine. So uh, this sort of feeds into both our ideas on how we want to explain latitudes to immigration, not so much in short-term effects, though these are important, don't get us wrong, but in terms of the really underlying factors, what, what guides people to their behaviors moreover, including their attitudes to immigration. And then what can we do with that? So what, who cares? Well, I think political messaging and, and communication is a start. The idea that uh, to, to talk about immigration, we need to not think about people like ourselves, dare I say it in this room, but also those people who have perfectly legitimate other values, who want other things from life, uh, none of which are better than the others, but tend to be not on things like diversity, but on stability, but on security. So to sum up, what both Andrew and I have said, attitudes to immigration are pretty stable, even becoming more favorable. The, the old are dying off, the young are coming through, essentially. Yet, despite that, the puzzle is that the radical right are growing at a faster rate than before. And this is because latent anti-immigration attitudes are being activated by higher immigration rates than ever before, and perceptions of disorder. And this is partially the result of one of the most important predictors of attitudes, human values, which I say are very stable, inherent in us, to some extent, because they're to some extent the result of cognitive patterns and things. And uh, finally, the result of that is that future messaging really should take a more balanced value-based approach when talking about immigration, when thinking about immigration policy. So on that, I'll, I'll leave it and pass over to our next speaker. Uh, thank you, James. I think, as you can see, we're, we're very excited by this, and, and, and hopefully we've uh, communicated our excitement to develop this project. I should also have mentioned at the start that you all got a little USB stick when you arrived, uh, but there's no such thing as a free USB stick from us. <laughs> On it, you also find some of our publications, some of the things we've been talking about, but also other publications which you think you might find interesting. We've less space for your own files as well, but we've, uh, we've put some things that we, you may find interesting uh, as well to, to support that. And I think what James and I have tried to communicate is the resource we're creating, some of the analysis that we've done, but we've, there is a lot more that could be done. And we, I think we need to be modest in what we, we say. We're beginning this process, and uh, we're going to be developing this work over, over years to come. So... I'm very happy now we, we, to, ha to, to hand over to other members of our panel. Uh, what we're going to do is they're going to speak for, say, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can have a general Q&A and discussion and, and share our ideas. So we're going to go in the order as, as kind of the order sat at, at the front. And we're going to first, we, we'll hear from uh, Jean-Christophe Dumont. Uh, who is the head of the International Migration Division of the Directorate for Employment, Labour and <coughs> Social Affairs at the OECD. Thank you. Mike is here. Okay. Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Andrew and James, uh, for this presentation. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to participate in the launch of this uh, Observatory of Public Attitude to Migration. Um, I believe this is a great initiative and the OSD is uh, really happy to support it and we look forward to uh, synergies and possible cooperation with MPC in this context. Um, let's face it, I mean, a common public perception is that migration is uncontrolled and costly. 
and control because borders are perceived not to be secured. Costly because immigrants are assumed to displace native workers and to come for social benefits. We know, I hope you know, uh, that this is not the case. Migration, uh, if well managed, can bring economic and social benefits to destination and origin country, to both migrants and non-migrants. We have numerous high quality empirical analyses that clearly show that. But having experts among themselves to agree will not in itself be enough to change those who have a negative public opinion. So let me briefly address four questions. Um, so first is, what do we know about the impact of migration? Uh, going very quickly through it. Uh, why is there is a gap between public perception and reality? Why does this matter? And what can we do about it? So let's start with the facts. In destination country, immigrants play a significant role in the labor market by providing labor in a variety of occupation and sector. Between 2005 and 15, for example, new immigrants accounted for 20% of labor market entries in true strongly going occupation in both the United States and Europe. Uh, this notably include healthcare and STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics occupation. In the meantime, immigrants represented about a third of entries in true strongly declining occupation in Europe, those who have lost uh, employment. In this area, immigrants are filling labor needs uh, by taking up jobs regarded by native workers as an attractive or lacking career prospect. These are the people who are in a home taking care of uh, children and elderly parents, for example. Um, on another key topic, which is uh, about the fiscal impact, the OECD work which we published in the International Migration Outlook in 2013 has shown that in almost all OECD countries, migrants contribute more in tax and social contribution than they receive in individual benefits. Uh, in other words, they contribute to the financing of public goods, also to a lesser extent uh, than the native born in a number of countries. Where immigrants have a less favorable fiscal position than their native born peers, this is not driven by greater dependence on social benefits, but rather by the fact that often they have lower employment and wage and thus contribute less. This is again contrary to the widespread public belief. The evidence is clear. Uh, and this is only two examples, but we could find many more, uh, including from outside the OECD, by the way. <laughs> Evidence are clear. Immigrants do not come here to steal our jobs or benefits from the welfare state. The economy is not a cake to be divided among more people. More people does not imply smaller portion because migration does not work as a zero-sum game. Recent evidence from the European Social Survey that you referred to in your introduction however, clearly show that many people are doubtful about the positive economic impact of migration. Although this is not true everywhere, as you pointed out, in a number of European countries, more people believe that migration is bad for the economy than the opposite. In addition, also about a quarter of European respondents, again, that's the same figure, uh, think that migration is never good or bad, they are in the middle. Uh, those who have extremely negative views on migration are more numerous than those who have very positive views. So, uh, but, but why there's such a gap, such a disconnect between the result of your empirical research and the impact of migration and public perception? I mean, you could well say that we are not good in communicating these results, but I, I don't think this is the only explanation. We, are cert we could certainly do better, but this is not the only explanation. One explanation lies, and I am sure that a, a colleague from Ipsos will also point to that, a widespread knowledge gap uh, regarding the relative importance of migration. Overall, opinion pools reveal that people typically overestimate, sometimes by a factor of two or more, the share of immigrants in the population and underestimate the economic potential of recently arrived immigrants. So there is also a time dimension here. Fighting against such prejudice by informing the public debate with sound and update facts remains an important task. But as I said, I don't think this is enough. Another possible explanation 
is that individual perceptions are based on the local uh, impact in areas where vulnerable migrants tend to be concentrated. Avail available evidence actually suggests that low-skilled immigrants tend to be concentrated in most disadvantaged areas. The local impact in such areas, even for people who don't live there, may actually deviate from the average impact. And due to the specific local effect, the costs and benefits from migration may be unevenly distributed across the country, across the level of governments, and across groups. As a result, evidence based on aggregate effects are not trusted. Why bother? Well, I can see at least four reasons why we should be concerned about this gap between the perception and the reality on migration issue. First one is that if some people are ignorant about migration issue, get it wrong about the size and the composition, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are opposed to migration. And indeed, when people are told the actual share of migrants in their country before we ask them whether they think uh, that we should have more or less migration, they are usually less likely to say that there are too many immigrants. I mean, from transatlantic trend survey has shown that in Italy, France, and Greece, the proportion of people complaining that there are too many immigrants is, uh, is, uh, falls by half if you uh, inform them first about how many immigrants there is. Second reason is that we have ample evidence that perception shape policies. Um, whatever uh, is the basis of this perception. And again, some OECD work that we published in 2010 on public opinions and immigration, individual attitudes, interest group, and media, show that belief about the economic and cultural impact of migration significantly influence attitudes toward opening the border to migrants. And in all OECD countries, people who think that migrants are net contributors are more willing to accept additional migration flows. The third reason is that extremist views on migration are reinforced by preconceived ideas and ignorance. In recent years, and that was also shown on your graph from The uh, Economist, uh, there is a widespread perception uh, that the share of public holding extreme views on migration has grown. The consequence of that is that the public debate on migration is less and less defined by the median position and increasingly by the extremes. Governments obviously must respond to this vocal and polarized position, which makes it difficult to ensure that policy is evidence-based, and therefore urgent to regain a political space to discuss migration. The fourth and last uh, reason why this matter is, to my point of view, is because where migration has become uh, a polarizing issue, extreme views reinforce bias between residents and contribute to radicalization of individual communities and the electorate where perception of migration are more negative, the risk of discrimination is higher. These stereotypes may affect the behavior of immigrants themselves and may lead to a disaffection with your country, rendering uncertainties about migration a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is a case where obviously everybody loses. So what can we do about it? Well, international migration is a very sensitive issue in most countries. And maybe just to, to, to uh, add a point uh, uh, in, in reference to what you said, I mean, there is one specificity regarding migration, is that we're talking about outsiders. So that, that may make migration different. One of the reasons uh, why it's so sensitive is because it touches upon the very notion of a nation state. Change in the rules regarding who can enter or stay legally, who can settle, with your or family, who can obtain citizenship or can vote, have implication on the composition of your country, of your society, and its institutions. In face of growing migration, the public seems to have lost uh, confidence in government capacity to control border, manage migration, and ensure successful integration. It's therefore important to signal that things are under control and rebuild, rebuild trust on migration policies and institutions. By this, I mean that this is obviously not only a communication question. This cannot be done if migration is seen as an area where the rule of law does not apply. Government must first tackle the challenge of irregular migration and illegal employment of migrants. Opening up to labor migration needs to be accompanied by appropriate safeguards. 
Another key challenge here is to develop a well-defined and robust migration policy while maintaining its ability to respond to unexpected shocks. Recently, countries have con been confronted with migration shocks over which there is little discretionary policy control. But to visibly remain in control of the situation and of its aftermaths, public policy must be able to adapt quickly and at all levels, local, national, regional, and international. I mean, I think that everybody can agree that we need to make some progress there. Leadership and effective communication is also critical when politi political leaders try to avoid the political debate on migration. This is not the case everywhere, but in a couple of European countries, that has been the case for a long time. This gives room to extremist views to prosper. At the same time, overly rosy approaches to migration issue are counterproductive for the exact reason that you've mentioned. I mean, maybe the values behind. So it only satisfies those who are already convinced that mig more migration is necessarily a good thing. Actually, as I said before, there might be winners and losers to migration. Welcoming refugees, for example, is costly, and labor market integration of immigrants and their children is not always straightforward. Recognizing this fact and adopting a balanced, fact-based public discourse on migration is a precondition for any effective communication strategy aiming at closing the gap between perception and reality. Public opinion is also determined to a broad extent by the ways these issues are covered by the media. I mean, yes, it's not the only explanation, but it's part of it, probably. But obviously, we have to understand why this is the case, and medias are also um, uh, often in response to pressure from competitors may convey simplistic message of shorter time to uh, explain complex issues. And you know, bad outcomes uh, are always good for sales. So I mean, how you, you, you compensate for that is, is very uh, uh, complex. But last but not least, uh, I think that part of the skepticism regarding uh, uh, migration is linked to um, the perception that immigrants' willingness to integrate uh, is, is weak. Uh, integration outcomes to migrants who have arrived previously not recent migrants, may indeed be taken as a marker for success or failure of current migration policies. So we did some work with uh, uh, the European Commission, DG Migration and Home Affairs. We published these uh, uh, indicators of integration uh, for immigrants and their children settling in. A key result of this work is that immigrants may have lower outcome that native born, but perhaps surprisingly, this is uh, more the case at the top end of a qualification scale uh, that at the lower end. Uh, furthermore, despite noticeable progress across generation, a significant share of children of low educated immigrants' parents in Europe have unfavorable education labor market outcomes. And we argue that um, it would be difficult to um, explain to the public that future migration will be beneficial if we don't make a better job at using the skills of immigrants who are already here. A successful integration policy um, is a precondition for ensuring support for future migration and policy and migration policy reform. Countering extremist views on migration and more generally improving the public perception of migration requires not only transparent, relevant data and better ways to communicate them, but also requires leadership to identify and tackle these policy failures. So I wish food that the observatory we are launching here today uh, will become a key tool to enlighten uh, this much needed leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Jean uh, we, we, we very much hope that too. Uh, thank you, thank you for those remarks. And I'd now like to invite uh, Elizabeth Collett, who is founding director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe and uh, senior advisor to the MPI's Transatlantic Council on Migration. Thank you, Andrew. At least part of that title has to go. It's far too long. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and particularly the Migration Policy Centre, and particularly for conveniently uh, locating this panel in my office building. Very helpful. 
Um, I think it's really important that, that, that this initiative has been set up in, to no to great extent because we need to get to the next level data that digs into exactly the characteristics, but also understanding the dynamic, putting together the dynamics of migration with the various characteristics of, of individuals. And James, by the way, funnel of causality is going to be my new explanation for being habitually late, <laughs> going from my inbuilt, inherent poor time management all the way through to traffic. <laughs> um, no one's going to get away with that. Um, I wanted to outline just this morning uh, three traps we tend to fall into, uh, but from three perspectives. So that of the policy wonk, which I think encompasses 90% of us in Brussels, that of the politician and the pol political advisor, and that of the comparative researcher. Um, and then I want to add a few thoughts specifically about the EU in this debate, as it has a kind of unique and particularly challenging position. Um, to start with the folly of the policy wonk, um, we have become drawn into uh, a constant roller coaster of populist and far right party successes or failures in the electoral cycle of various European countries. Every election rewrites the narrative of whether we've crossed a new line, whether it was just a bubble and we've gone back to the status quo, but, and, and whether support is, is, is circular or not. But electoral results are an extremely poor metric for gauging what is really going on in a country, and particularly at grassroots level. Um, so the more data that gets to the heart of that problem, um, and I think James's articulation that this isn't necessarily new changes in attitudes, but rather an activation of pre-existing attitudes, already, I think, starts changing the way you then think about electoral participation and, 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 and the role of uh, populist and far-right groups. Um, in terms of the folly of the politicians, well, there are many. Uh, but there has been a tendency in the last year amongst mainstream parties to try and recapture their perceived loss of support or actual loss of support uh, to more fringe parties by wearing their clothes. We've seen this particularly on immigration policy becoming much more hardline and messaging much more hardline messages. A, a good example is the, 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 the Dutch election where uh, Prime Minister Rutte took out a full page advert in one of the leading Dutch newspapers saying, if you're, if you're not willing to be normal, then you should leave. That's quite a populist message to put out there and not a message that you would expect from a mainstream party, but it was designed to basically say, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you, I'm part of this uh, conversation. Uh, it is perhaps a self-defeating uh, approach in many ways because the core extremely negative group are not going to be convinced by a new emperor. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, address their concerns, but it does legitimize them for people who are anxious or wavering and wondering whether their feelings of concern have a root in, 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 in legitimate policy. So then it basically takes a smaller group, a small core group who are never going to be movable and creates the proportion of people who go, well, actually, maybe I'm right to be wrong about this. Uh, maybe I should have these feelings, and actually it, it creates a knock-on effect. And many of these very simplistic populist policies turn out to be very unpopular because, surprise, surprise, when people try to implement them, it's not always possible, and they fail. Um, that doesn't necessarily then maintain the support for the mainstream party that's responsible, but for the populist party who can sit on the fringes and win either way. Um, if, I, if I'd been in charge, I would have got it right. They wouldn't have failed. So it does create, I think, a, a, a dangerous cycle whereby uh, we find ourselves increasingly legitimizing uh, quite extreme views. And I think for the comparative researchers' folly, uh, for those of us who've studied Europe, have, have found often we have to go down to the very simplistic level of explanation when drawing comparative conclusions because there's so little data comparable across geographical borders. So we make sweeping generalizations about the mood in Germany or Hungary or the UK, or whatever. Um, and I think there are several dimensions to this that it would be worth digging into. The first is that the debate and the reasoning in different countries ca it shifts enormously uh, dependent on context. In the UK, we have a debate about free movement that was occasionally fueled by a sense of crisis on the mainland but to me, the conversation was extremely different in 2015 and 2016 in the UK from the rest of Europe. Uh, it was about EU nationals. In Germany, the conversation was about numbers, about fear of what was coming next. And in Hungary and Central Europe, the conversation is much more about ethnicity and other and foreignness 
uh, reducing our sense of national identity. There are common themes that run across these, but the way they're characterized differs enormously. I think a second element to really think about is, is how do we incorporate the minority view here? There is an increasing proportion of individuals who are either migrants themselves or have immigrant background who are part of these polls. Do we disaggregate those views? Do we really understand the characteristics of, of, of division amongst populations, not just rural, urban, not just age, geography, or socioeconomic lines, but also background? It, it's tended to be um, underestimated. And I think we also have to think about the diversity of migration flows themselves. Uh, I was struck by, by some of these changes in attitudes between 2002 and 2015 and wondering how much of that is down to the benefits or challenges of free movement, how much of that was down to fluctuations in third country national movements. Are we talking about immigration or emigration? Um, it, you know, do we understand what migration trends are feeding into what attitudes? And I think uh, the Migration Policy Center is well placed to start, start weaving that together a little bit more. Um, I say that because you know, some of the few, and I think you know, the Brexit vote has offered an opportunity, and I'm looking forward to hearing Bobby's view on this. The Brexit vote was one of the richer data sets that emerged in Europe, across Europe, and we suddenly found lots of interesting things that we hadn't known before. Um, I'm not suggesting we have a referendum on the EU in every country in order to get that data, but how can we get the data without the political crisis? That would be quite interesting to know. But some of the polling in the, in the last decade that has digged a little deeper has come up with really interesting and, and sometimes from a researcher's perspective counterintuitive uh, findings that we, we rarely have the opportunity or the resources to follow up. And, and one from the GMF's Transatlantic Trends from years ago, they did one very detailed survey and they asked people, would you prefer migrants to be temporary or permanent? Fully expecting everyone to say we'd prefer them to be temporary, we prefer them to go home at the end. And actually, there was a, a, a sort of a, a majority in favour of permanence. If you're coming to my country, I want you to join my society. I want you to participate and be a long-term member, which is certainly counterintuitive from a policymaker's view, which has placed a lot of emphasis in recent years on "Don't worry, they'll all be going home soon." This is not, uh, and there is a conflict there between the narrative of incorporation and participation in society, and this idea that "Don't worry, it's it's they're not going to to to." dilute our national identity, as, as, as some of the narratives are um, highlighting. I think the European Union suffers from the double whammy of being um, seen as being responsible for much of the immigration, and certainly in the front seat over the last couple of years with respect to, to the surges in numbers across the Mediterranean, and EU management. Um, and the fact of being the EU itself. I mean, the EU in many ways embodies universalism. Uh, there is an argument, I have occasionally made it behind closed doors, uh, that the EU should just be very, very quiet on the positive narrative of migration because its very existence and concept is actually not helping in terms of, 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 of promoting a positive view of migration or changing minds. Um, but they also become a usual scapegoat in the sense that they are in the driving seat on some parts of immigration policy, but the critical tools to fulfill the promises made lie at the national level. Um, I think a second challenge is that the key metric for success, particularly emerging over the last two years, has been numbers of all kinds. The numbers of arrivals month to month. Two, three years ago, no one cared month to month how many people arrived, well, some of us did, over the Mediterranean or wouldn't be able to tell you. Now, every month when the new data comes out, there's a rash of media interviews. Is this meaningful? What does this mean? And, and, and often you have to say, well, let's take a step back. Let's, let's see what the overall trends are telling us. So we have an obsession with numbers as a metric of whether our policies are working or not, and that's an incredibly superficial way to look at that. Um, and also, I think, you know, the narratives that we've created in the EU on, on issues like return, um, how money is spent, setting quotas for things, success or failure becomes a percentage rather than the quality of the policy being implemented and its overall sustainability. There are different metrics to think about this, and actually I would suspect that for publics, those metrics might matter more and, and, and be further down the funnel of causality than necessarily the month-to-month -month numbers, which are, which are similar, I think, in, in, in terms of the sort of media debate and, and the, and the impact that has on people. Um, the EU's focus on signaling has become much stronger and much more evident in recent years. 
Uh, much of the EU Turkey deal was as much about sending a message this route is closed and closure of the Western Balkans route as it was about the implementation of that deal, which has been patchy. Some parts have worked well, some parts have not worked at all and created significant distress. Um, this is fine as long as it's then backed up by action. Uh, but too often that message is not accompanied by action, which creates a hollow expect expectation which is rarely fulfilled. And that, I think, can create a backlash then in the long term. It's fine in the short term to do this, but if you're not following through with what you say, then you're creating additional mistrust and losing confidence amongst publics who are then feeling justified in saying, well, this government doesn't know how to deal with this issue because they can't say, they can't do what they say they're going to do. And finally, the EU struggles because there are certain fights it can't win. Um, the Hungarian domestic political debate is bolstered whether the EU wins a particular round of a fight or Hungary wins. Either the EU is uh, fulfilling its role, its demonised role as overbearing, taking away our sovereignty, making us do things we don't want to do if they win. If the EU loses, then they are weak, we are strong, they are a bureaucratic non-entity. So the narrative the EU can't win means that it needs to start picking its battles more carefully and really think about what principles it explicitly wants to uphold based on a future Europe it wants to see. And we've experienced over the last two years increasing muddiness about what that means for us um, and what a values-based approach, which James mentioned, would look at. Because we've run through so many taboos over the last two years, it's unclear now what the European Union's red lines are on migration and what the next steps are. The goals are very broadly articulated, but the means to affect them are, are, are very fast paced and fast moving. So it's very difficult to uphold a rhetorical stance of a values-based approach to migration when many of the things um, that are being undertaken are much less clear. And um, I think I will leave it there so that we can have a nice discussion. Thank you, Liz. That was, uh, I'm sure there's many points there, as with Jean-Christophe, which we can turn to in, in discussion. And, and I'm very happy to introduce our, our third speaker, Bobby Duffy, who is the Managing Director of Ipsos Maury Social Research Institute and Global Director of the Ipsos Social Research Institute. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Andrew. And, and being Ipsos, uh, we've got slides. We can't seem to talk without slides, so you've got some more data to look at. Uh, now, um, if you can see that over there. So, um, first of all, to say, the first thing to say is that there's an absolute wealth of attitudinal data on immigration. I spent a year of my life uh, just looking at attitudinal data on immigration just in the UK, and it wasn't enough. I could have done with two years of trying to dig into all this. And um, it was one of the most depressing times of my research uh, career, not because of the nature of the attitudes, um, really, but because of exactly what James has described, that uh, there's much more stability in them than people think. You, you see so many headlines that say this is a new thing that we found on immigration, and you can see it throughout the data over a number of years. So stability uh, dressed up as change was a real frustration. And then, as, as James said as well, the nuance in people's views. That people, uh, whenever you see these, these findings discussed, people miss the nuance, and there is, there is several layers of nuance in people's immigration attitudes. Which, uh, um, so from that, from that point of view, we're delighted to support OPAM with our data uh, to have someone look into this in more detail, bring it across, uh, bring it together across lots of different sources. I'm going to talk briefly about two new studies. Um, one you might have seen just recently. We just released a 25-country study uh, in the last couple of weeks with 11 of the countries in Europe, and it's a study that we've been running since 2011, so it's got some trends, um, and uh, we can see how that's changed in recent times. And then there's a, a really interesting UK-only uh, study, but it's, the reason I'm going to show it is because it's longitudinal, so it's tracking the same individuals over that uh, very live experiment that Elizabeth <laughs> talked about uh, between 2015 through to post-Brexit vote, and that's for Unbound Philanthropy with their support. So I'm going to try and make five quick points. Um, so I would say views of immigration are generally not that positive. They're not terribly negative, uh, but, uh, and they're varied across different issues, as James has said, but they're, they're not massively positive, but they are stable and even improving, just to echo what James said. So just to pick out a few things, 75% uh, think immigration has increased over the fi uh, last five years. Uh, that was 80% in 2011, so there's a sense of declining uh, level of change, but still pretty high. 
48% uh, across, this is across the 25 country study, 48% um, think that there are too many immigrants. It was 52% in 2011, so it's kind of gone down a little bit. But massive, big variation across uh, the countries that we cover in the, the 25 country study. 83% think it's, there's too many immigrants in Turkey, 66% in Italy, so two-thirds of the population in Italy. This is from the latest survey. And 44% think immigration is changing a country in the way that they don't like. Um, and that goes from 77% in Turkey, 63% in Italy, and then 56% even here in uh, Belgium. Um, so I, it's a big old data set, so I won't show you loads of charts from it, but just to pick out one. Uh, only one in five think immigration has a positive impact on, on this question. It's different from the 10-point scale questions uh, or 11-point scale questions that James talked about. But on this question, whether it's very or fairly positive uh, impact on your country, You've got 21% of people overall across these 25 countries saying it's had a positive impact, but big variation. Um, obviously, we're looking outside Europe as well as uh, within Europe. You've got Saudi Arabia, India, and then Great Britain, third in this list, uh, which is incredible, and I'll come back to in a second. Uh, and then Canada, Australia, US, and then a big drop to Sweden, and then all the way down to Hungary, Serbia, Turkey, um, at the bottom there, where you've got very few people, down to 5% in Hungary, saying that it's had a, a, a very or fairly positive impact on uh, their country. But the point, from a change point of view, is almost identical aggregate findings in 2011, um, pre-crisis. Uh, so it's kind of, it's uh, not as much change uh, as you expect, but it is changing differently. That aggregate position hides very different trajectories in different countries, as we've seen. So, I'm, again, not got time to pick out loads of these, uh, but just looking at the trends um, in three countries, no, the scale's gone, but you can get, uh, effectively, that goes from 20-ish percent saying it's been a positive, uh, very or fairly positive impact on Britain, up to about 35, 40 percent uh, in Great Britain. Uh, US, similar sort of trajectory, not quite as um, marked as Britain, but similar sort of trajectory. So you've got the two countries where immigration has been a key factor in political decisions, where actually the public opinion has been going up, significantly doubling. And then Sweden actually going in the other direction, balancing uh, that perspective in more recent times. So that, yeah, oh, you can see the scale. I can't see it on here. So you can see that over the time, those sort of time frames, it's been quite a recent shift in Sweden, maybe not picked up in European social survey uh, results quite yet. Um, one of the points, again, we talked, John Christoph and others talked about the interaction between attitudes and reality in this. And, and that report that took us two years in total to do was called Perceptions and Reality for a reason, because there is a really important aspect of comparing perceptions to reality on immigration, more so than, than lots of studies. Um, uh, and there, there are uh, very interesting interactions between people's attitudes and the realities that uh, I'm sure uh, the observatory is going to look at in more detail. This is, this is very crude. Um, so all we've got here is up the side, you've got the percentage of people that are positive about immigration for the countries, the 25 countries, and along the bottom, you've got the percentage of foreign-born population in 2015. And you can see there's, there's some relationship, but very little between actual migrant uh, stock and uh, uh, attitudes to it. And you've got this kind of column uh, that com uh, covers a lot of Europe, where you've got pretty similar between 10 and, and 15 percentage uh, points of the population, uh, but very different attitudes on whether it's positive or negative, whether immigration is positive or negative. And then across the side there, uh, across to the side, you've got the countries where it's actually relatively low levels of immigration, but very negative views of kind of Turkey's, Serbia's, Hungary's, and Italy's. And I'm, I'm showing this really to make the point that uh, these sort of static pictures are not that much use in predicting attitudes. Really, it's about pace of change, perceptions of pace of change, actual levels of change, uh, et cetera. Um, and hopefully we'll get into this in discussion because there's some really interesting and important points about how you communicate facts on this and the extent to which uh, these attitudes are driven by facts or emotions or cultural values, as, as uh, Andrew and, and James has, has put out. Um, what we say is uh, people's misperceptions on the actual facts on um, uh, immigration are as much to do with something the social psychologists would call emotional enumeracy. 
um, but it's not just a careful understanding of the facts, it's actually an emotional reaction to the fact, that, to the people's perception of the facts. So what that means, in effect, is when people are answering these questions, they've got accuracy goals. If they're trying to estimate, as Jean Christophe says, the immigrant population, uh, if you're asking them how, how much of your country uh, is foreign-born, when they're answering that, they've got accuracy goals, but they've also got directional goals, where they're trying to send a message about what's worrying them, whether that's consciously or not. So it has really important implications. It means that misperceptions, the, the cause and effect, goes in both directions on misperceptions, that it's your emotion that causes your misperception as much as your misperceptions causing uh, your, your uh, uh, reaction. Um, so that has really important implications for communication. It means that myth-busting is not enough. Facts are not enough on this. It's about the emotional narrative, which I'll come back to in a second. Second point, which is quicker than the first. Um, even where the change is positive, this isn't leading to fewer wanting to reduce numbers. And I'm just using UK as a case study here. We see UK has been one of the biggest shifts, seen one of the biggest shifts. Britain has been seen one of the biggest shifts in a more positive way on their attitudes to immigration. But when you ask people, do you think the number of immigrants coming to Britain nowadays should be increased a lot, increased a little, remain the same, reduced a lot, reduced a little? Um, we've seen them a, a doubling of people saying immigration is a positive impact. But across the same sort of period, you see very little change in people saying that immigration should be reduced. Uh, there's a little bit of softening, uh, down 42 to 37, pre and post Brexit, in terms of people wanting it reduced a lot. But overall, it's a pretty stable picture. So it depends pe on what you ask people on this. It's, it, it's saying that they've got a more positive attitude does not mean to say that you'll see a change in uh, action-based uh, measures like these type as well. Uh, third point is that the, there are cultural and economic drivers of uh, nativist, anti-immigrant, whatever, um, sentiment, uh, and on EU referendum too. And it's probably the case uh, that the economic drivers have been emphasised more than the cultural drivers, but all the evidence points to the cultural drivers, as James has pointed out, being more important in many ways. Um, so both interact, There's the, you can't separate them entirely, but if you, if you were putting an emphasis on something, it's the cultural drivers that seem the most important. So this is from the, the UK study for Unbound. Um, and this is, uh, we, we did last uh, uh, 4,000 people over a long period of time between 2015 to uh, post-Brexit vote, a whole load of attitudes. It's, it's the only longitudinal study on immigration that goes into this level of detail, we think. Uh, and it allowed us to create factors, how, how attitudes kind of group together into types of values and uh, 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 different, different attitudinal groupings. And then it allowed us to run analysis like this, which is a regression analysis, just seeing what's most associated with the nativist anti-immigrant sentiment that we, we created from lots of different uh, questions. And the thing that is most associated, explains most variation on whether you have a, a nativist, anti-immigrant sentiment, is, again, echoing what James says, is people that don't value diversity. And the really interesting thing about that factor was it's not just about not living in neighbourhoods that have got diverse ethnic groups, it's about diversity of ideas as well, which very much echoes with that values-based thing. So it's people who don't like hearing opinions that are different from theirs. Uh, really fascinating that that groups with that and then is the biggest explanation of nativist and anti-immigrant sentiment. So it's, it's diversity in a much broader sense, and it ties very much to James's view of uh, the underlying values of security, uh, etc., that people have. Uh, the second is opposed to political correctness and suspicious of human rights. Again, um, uh, there's a, a strong sense in which that is protecting other people and not uh, them. Uh, so that opposition to political correctness and suspicion of human rights, again, people were surprised that came out quite so strongly. Uh, then there's two that I think are linked, um, in my mind at least, uh, the nostalgic for Britain's past and thinking that we'll be in a strong position to negotiate a trade uh, post-Brexit. So there's that sense of looking back on Britain in some ways and, say, and thinking that we're special in uh, some aspects. Uh, strong sense of authoritarianism. Uh, interesting, these two grouped together uh, come out as, it, it seemed quite opposite, but a sense of strong authoritarianism, do not trust experts. You can see in the rhetoric, authoritarian rhetoric, the undermining of experts is very important. And then it's only really after that that you get down to the things that could be counted as more economic factors that they don't believe that the system doesn't work, that they don't believe the system works for them, that the system is broken um, for them, and strong belief that individuals uh, should look after themselves. And I'll just show you the EU referendum vote 
uh, one. So we did the same sort of analysis, both on immigration and nativist attitudes, but then on uh, how people voted in, in the referendum uh, as well. And we did that because of the interaction between those sorts of issues. So the top thing in voting to leave the EU referendum is that nativist anti-immigrant sentiment. That was the key driver attitudinally towards uh, uh, wanting to leave. And then the next one was distrust in experts. That was the, the, the second most associated uh, factor. So, and then a whole load of other things which are very similar to the uh, 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 immigrant, anti-immigrant and nativist sentiment with an added bit about globalization. So people being against globalization, which is interesting given our positioning of opening up Britain, supposedly. Um, fourth point is that, so that's what uh, the overall drivers are. So that they're the drivers for the population as a whole. But the key thing, again, goes to something uh, Elizabeth was saying, and James, is that different people have very different drivers of views. Understanding that at an aggregate level is all very well, but actually the segmentation within the population is very, very important to understand, which a lot of the campaigners and others working in, in this sort of area have really focused on. Um, so we also conducted a segmentation analysis on the UK data, and it comes up with different, uh, four different population segments that kind of go in a range from the most negative to immigration, about immigration, the most positive to immigration. And, and our one here breaks down into four groups that are about equal size. Um, at the top, you've got an anti-immigration group, which we had at about 28%. I won't go through all the detail of it, but they, they've got, they're the strongest anti-immigrant group. Then in the middle, uh, you've got uh, a group of um, comfortably off but culturally concerned. And they're more concerned and more anti-immigrant than the next group, which is uh, the people that are under financial pressure. Um, so you've got this kind of spectrum of uh, levels of anti-immigrant sentiment that goes from a clear group that are anti-immigrant no matter what, uh, a group that's comfortably off but culturally concerned, and then, then it's only that you get to uh, people that are financially under pressure. And then at the bottom, you've got another group, about a quarter of the population, that are open to immigration. We did the same for the EU referendum, and it kind of mirrors the same sort of sentiments. And actually, the most positive about the EU were actually under some, some of the groups were, were under the most financial pressure. So it's much more about these, these cultural factors. And this pattern of this group, about 20 to 25% who are anti-immigrant, uh, a similar sized group at the other end, and then two groups in the middle, split by culture and economic drivers, is kind of reflected again and again in studies that look at segmentation in different countries. I'll just show you one from uh, uh, friends at Purpose um, who have been doing this type of work across different countries in Europe. This is from Germany, looking specifically at refugees. But they've got uh, these types of segmentations which work across different countries where effectively you've got economically liberal to protectionists up and down and then culturally pluralistic to nativists going aside. And you've got this, this spectrum of going from liberal cos cosmopolitans to radical opponents. And then this group in the middle, very, very similar sort of themes coming out of economic pragmatists and humanit humanitarian skeptics who are similarly conflicted who are conflicted but for very different reasons and understanding the nuance and difference in people's uh, concern about immigration, really important if you're gonna be messaging them, uh, what sort of messages you need to put to them. Final point is that even this uh, level of uh, nuance and segmentation, understanding drivers and how it differs in different situations, hides a lot of individual level difference. So aggr this aggregate change hides individual change. In, in academic terms, it's the difference between gross change and net change. So all of these studies that look at cross-sectional surveys can only identify net change. You need to look at the gross change because within that stability, the people flowing around between different views over time. And that's what the longitudinal study was trying to get at and is still trying to get at. So we've been tracking individual level change on this longitudinal study all the way back from 2015. I'm only showing you from 2016. But you can see that people move in and out. This is a flow chart following individuals. People move in and out of different uh, different views and attitudes on immigration. This is just whether you want immigration reduced or increased. Um, uh, and not masses of movement, but more movement the, than you would see if you were just looking at two points in time in a cross-sectional survey. So understanding this type of change, who's moving in and out and why, is really important. When we did this chart first, I was really worried and <laughs> depressed in some ways because it looks like the increased group changes more 
uh, the, the small group. It's a small group of 7% uh, who want immigration increased. And we thought that would be quite a stable group over time. You either think that or not. And it looks like it's quite, um, uh, quite changeable, unlike the reduced group. But actually, we did some more digging on this, combining individual level change with the segmentations with the idea that we hope to get greater evidence of uh, who shifts more. Is there more shift in this conflicted or persuadable middle uh, in the UK that the campaigns are focused on? Basically, when you're, when you're discussing immigration, you kind of forget the people that are very pro, you forget the people that are very anti, and you focus on that middle is, is a lot of the discussion. Uh, whether um, the economically or culturally concerned are moved the most, we were trying to understand what are the dynamics of change, what, what happens in these types of things. And unfortunately, so far, only one point is clear, is, is actually that that open to immigration moved the least. So that is correct, it seems, from our analysis, that actually, if you're looking at shifting views on uh, uh, attitudes to immigration, you kind of shouldn't be targeting your messages on that universalist point that James was making, because that's kind of a one argument with that group. Uh, the rest were similar, but actually, it's the anti-immigrant group that moved the most up and down and in and out of these types of things. So they were actually much less stable than we thought. So it kind of points to don't only think about the middle, do think about the messages for the ones that kind of come out as uh, anti-immigrant groups. But uh, there was no big differences in movement between different demographic groups. We couldn't identify a particular thing. So effectively, what I'm saying is we haven't answered the question uh, very well. We've got our report out in October, uh, but uh, this is exactly the reason why we need uh, institutions like the observatory to unpick this more. There's much more we can learn. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Bobby. And I think that's shown uh, that political crisis, as, as Liz says, can lead to some great data that maybe won't wish it on the rest of Europe. Uh, but some, I think in all the contributions, some really fascinating themes have uh, been picked out. So what we'd like to do now is uh, open the floor for uh, comments and questions. I need to make a, I feel a bit like I'm on an airline here, because you will find in the left-hand armrest of your chairs, <laughs> if you open them, you will find a microphone. Uh, and oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. Uh, but you will find, so if you do want to ask a question, you will find a microphone. I assume there's a button to switch it on so we can't all sing, uh, start singing at once. Uh, but that, so that, that, I think there's a roving mic as well for people who don't have access to the left-hand armrest. So I'd invite, and I would invite people who would like to contribute. If you could also introduce yourself as well, that would be nice. Thank you. I uh, have a number of hands. Maybe I would, might take a group. Uh, so uh, we have three people, then Barbara and then uh, Reina. So take three questions to start with. So yeah, you have the challenge of uh, the technology. Yes, thank you. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's the next challenge. Oh yeah, sorry, also for the live stream, it would be good if you could stand up when you ask your questions. Sorry for all these challenges. Okay. Thank you very much and thank you for this interesting introduction. Um, my name is Antsvi Wieslatsky, I work for Eurodiaconia. Our members are in all over Europe and they do a lot of work on integration of migrants and uh, also trying to put local populations together with migrants to contribute to a fight against growing ra racism, etc. Um, and it was mentioned very briefly um, that... Sorry, I forgot my question. <laughs> no, so my question is um, how you take into account um, successful integration in the past, because it was mentioned very, very briefly um, that there is, that we should uh, be careful about our words, or politi politi policy makers should be careful about their words, um, and have action be followed. And so I'm wondering if you took into consideration, or are planning to take into consideration, um, previous successes or failures of integration in some countries, I'm thinking about France, where there is a strong feeling, at least, that integration in the past has not been as good as it should be. Um, so, yeah, it would be interesting to see what effect this could have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and then I think uh, it's Barbara. Yeah. 
Well, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, Barbara Omen. Um, I'm involved in a big research project on called Cities of Refuge with an interest in local authorities and um, migrants and, and refugees in, in particular. And I suppose that's where my question comes for. This is clearly a fantastic initiative and, and congratulations on launching it and on the really interesting presentations. I was wondering to what extent you have been able or are able to look at the variance in attitudes towards migration at the local level and what explains for them the leadership element that Mr. Dumont um, uh, spoke about, also the interplay between context and attitudes that um, James Dennison spoke about in looking at longitudinal data, to what extent something like the local context, big cities, small cities, mayors, etc., political colors uh, matter. Thank you. Thank you. And then at the back, is there uh, Rainer Munz, European Commission. Um, it's more a remark than a question, although I would wonder how you, you're dealing with it. Um, when comparing the countries, um, and this is both true for the uh, Eurobarometer as well as for the Ipsos Mori uh, cross-country comparison, um, we're comparing countries that have immigration with countries that have no immigration or where the migrants are not perceived as migrants. Take the case of Russia, Serbia, and Hungary. There you have immigrants. But if these immigrants are ethnic Russians coming from neighboring countries, ethnic Serbs coming from Bosnia, ethnic Hungarians coming from, I don't know, Transylvania or, or Vojvodina, they are most likely not perceived as migrants in the community. So when, we're t when people think about migration in Hungary, they think about Muslims that they have vaguely seen crossing their country um, um, two years ago. Um, and so talking about whether migra migration is good or bad, whether you want to have more or less of them, must make a difference, I mean, in the experience of people, whether they have any experience with it. So when we're talking about Saudi Arabia, yes, everybody in Saudi Arabia, has every Saudi has seen a migrant because, I don't know, 30% of the population are migrants. If you would go to Qatar or Bahrain, which are too tiny to be, to be, to be surveyed, um, I don't know, 80% of the population are migrants. So people have an actual exposure to migration and they can judge about it. If you talk to Hungarians or Serbs, the people that they have encountered as migrants, they don't count as migrants. Yeah, so an ethnic Hungarian from, from Vojvodina who lives there, they wouldn't say these are not migrants, these are people like us. And so if somebody in Hungary uh, speaks about migration, whether it's good or bad, or it should be more or less, the person has never experienced it. I just, I mean, it's, it's only a comment and you, you, you're probably aware of that. I'm just questioning or asking myself, how do we deal by comparing population that have an experience with the attitudes and the judgments of people that have absolutely no experience with migration. Thanks. Thank you. So what we've, we've I think there's some important issues thrown into the mix there. I may uh, maybe ask the panelists to respond, perhaps starting with James very briefly, just talking maybe some of our perspective from the OPAM project, and then going back to our uh, three panelists. Um, I don't, well, the first question was about integration, and I, I, I can't say I'm probably the best person to speak on that because I look at much more just attitudes so far, but I think it's something that we should definitely look at much more in attitudes to immigration. Uh, how, and this is something that's really useful, how do policies affect attitudes? And this is something that hasn't been looked at that much so far. Uh, maybe I'll let some of the other speakers respond on that hopefully a little bit more because I don't really have that much to say on that at the moment besides uh, it's something that should be looked at a lot more. Uh, on Barbara's uh, question about uh, how can we, exp how does the local level matter? I think this is a great question, and I think this is something we're looking at at the moment, actually. So um, we have some data on uh, Puglia, which is a region in the south, it's the boot of Italy. And there, of course, there's been a lot of um, irregular migration in the last um, few years. And what we've done is look at, um, measured people's attitudes to immigration, and also uh, we've got a geographic variable of how close they are to camps. And uh, we're looking at uh, the effect of distance from a migrant camp or proximity to a migrant camp on your attitudes to 
immigration and whether it makes any big difference or not. Unfortunately, we've only just started on this, so I don't really have any definitive results yet. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, talking about mayors and parties, um, at the local level, absolutely key, I agree. P party cues, as we call them, like to what extent people are driven by uh, the uh, by parties that are out there. Usually we think of that at the national level, but you're right, the local level matters more. Oh, I don't want to say matters more, but it certainly matters as well. Um, generally, I would be not skeptical of the effects. I would expect to see some effects, but generally they would be rather short term. So you'd see an instant reaction and then it would die out because it's so contextual. Like I say, it's such a proximal effect. But we haven't looked at that explicitly. Uh, I do think that the local context is something that that we will indeed look at a lot more. The last point from the third speaker, I couldn't agree more on the need to define terms. And when we talk about migration, it can mean almost an infinite number of different things. I think maybe 20 years ago, studies were far more naive in just thinking of, of migration or immigration just using a blanket term. But these days, uh, with work from institutions like Ipsos, as well as in universities as well, we're looking at far more nuanced questions on who we actually mean in terms of immigrants. And even just on some sort of basic groups, we see consistent differences. EU immigrants are treated uh, increasingly favorably and at a much faster rate than, the, than other groups in the last 15 years. People are becoming basically accepting free movement uh, as a given increasingly. Of course, this is in relative terms. Uh, and then there's also thinking about the religious background, the uh, skills background of these groups is being tested a lot more. So, and the ethnic background, ethnic similarity, as you say. Uh, so there's a lot more out there. It is being considered, and we will certainly consider it in our work. So, I'll just say very, very quickly as well, both of the points, the first and second points, as I said at the start, this is the launch of a project, not the end of a project. Feedback effects of previous policies, to understand more about those, to understand more about the city dimension, both in our migration research and in the wider uh, European University Institute, those are things that we would want to develop as part of our of, of our agenda. So I think it's, we're grateful for the suggestion because it kind of confirms to us areas that we'd want to pursue in the future as well. Yeah, um, I, I uh, fully subscribe to what has been said on, on integration. Actually, I, I think this is um, basically part of the story um, and that there is a strong inertia in some of these uh, uh, preferences and behaviors, some which may be, which are certainly linked to, uh, to values, some which are also linked to uh, the success and, and failure of past policies. And again, uh, the reason why this is so important is that there is, I, I, it seems at least, a lack of trust in, in governments, uh, in institutions, to do better than they have done in the past. So it would not be a problem uh, that uh, people perceive that integration was not success, so successful in the past if they would believe that their current uh, uh, people in charge would uh, be able to, to do better. But, but Part of the problem lies in the fact that this link has been lost on migration issue and that they do take integration outcomes as a marker of success or failure of current policies. And, and that's, uh, that's very complex to tackle or at least uh, cannot be tackled without uh, uh, looking at integration uh, uh, policies in the first place. And obviously you want to do that also for other reasons, uh, because that's uh, a, a lack of uh, a misuse of the skills which are there and, and it creates uh, there are many, many other reasons why you want to address the integration question, but, um, but this is uh, adding to the complexity. I think I just want to echo one point that Liz uh, mentioned that came back in, in the discussion, I think uh, Ryan and Monsieur, that's, that's also behind your point, is is I think it's it's a bit difficult to talk about migration in general, and and um, it's very necessary to go to the nitty gritty details of a question, uh, because uh, uh, migration well, is not s s such a thing as migration policy. There are migration policies. There are different components of of the management of the flows and. Uh, 
and different ways to address them. So some country may be very strict on some aspect of a migration and, and very open on some others. Uh, and, and, and so it's necessary, I think, in this analysis, not only to go in more details into the uh, characteristic of a person and, and of the, uh, how the uh, preferences are shaped, but also to, uh, let's say, deconstruct a little bit this uh, migration box, uh, in a way. I think one of the challenges with um, taking into account successful in integration is that successful integration is invisible by definition. If you're doing well in a society and there are no problems, there's nothing to show. I once wanted to write a book entitled Integration is Boring if You're Doing It Right. Surprisingly, I couldn't get a publisher. <laughs> um, but it was based around this premise. It, this should be a really dull topic. Um, the fact it is a flashpoint issue that we have bizarre political debates in different countries about the concept of multiculturalism, which is poorly understood by almost everyone involved in those debates, tells us that, that something else has gone wrong. The other thing I think is, is really important is, is I'd be interested to know how much integration anxieties are a proxy for the sense that public services and government provision of public services are not meeting people's expectations and the sense of scarcity and competition. And I think this is really important to get into over the next few years, given that there are a number of countries, you know, Sweden's a good example, where housing is going to become a significant issue. It's already a significant issue, but the cost and availability of housing in urban areas is going to really push, um, push a much stronger conversation on integration. Conversely, you know, we've seen Germany invest an enormous amount in integration. Um, and perhaps that's been calming in a way, that, that, take, that take control approach. We're going to invest in this. We're going to do these things. Of course, you know, if it doesn't work, then we might have a different discussion. But, you know, that, that take charge approach, I think, is important. And it always amazes me in the UK integration debate that the government doesn't come under more pressure for the fact it cut so much funding for language learning and all these other things in the UK um, nearly 10 years ago now. And, has never really had an integration policy, so to speak. Um, I think I read one, a list of integration, uh, integration initiatives funded with an integration fund, which included a street party to commemorate, um, commemorate Armistice Day as an integration measure, which seemed bizarre to me. Uh, so, you know, we should really think about uh, what that, that that investment looks like and uh, just to reiterate on, on personal leadership we did some research a few years ago looking at communication um, strategies at local level on on immigration and time and time again the best thought out formal strategies didn't have the impact they wanted the personal leadership of one individual whether it was a mayor or whether it was a housing officer who just got really inspired and put something forward one out every single time. That personal leadership and enthusiasm seems to trump the most beautifully laid out marketing strategy again and again and again. So we really need to invest in individuals who, 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 can, who can really um, bring these conversations to life. Thanks, Andrew. So just to pick up on the, yeah, that, that point about what does immigration mean in, in these types of studies, that was the third reason it was quite a depressing year of looking at immigration attitudes, because it is, it is such a, a term that needs unpacking. Um, I think your old colleagues, probably Andrew at Oxford, talked about imagined immigration as a, as a concept, that so we have a mental image of uh, what is our imagined immigration. We did a little bit of testing on that, just asking people what they had in mind when they were answering these questions on immigration. And there was a massive weighting towards asylum seekers and refugees. So it's, it's the smallest of the four main groups of immigrant sources within Britain, but it was by far the largest mental image that people had when they were answering these types of questions. And you can see it in all sorts of ways. We, in the same survey, you, depending on how you ask the question, you can get people to agree that uh, migrants take away jobs or they, they create jobs um, because people just switch their mental image of who they're thinking about as, as that particular migrant, depending on how, you, how you're doing it. So we need to be uh, really, really careful with how we understand that. And then, then beyond that, at a more 
direct level, there's been great experimental work that split sampled and asked people about different situations with uh, you know, varying people's level of support for migration, but for people with different skill levels, whether they're coming to fill jobs or seek jobs, with what source, what origin of country they come from, what origin religion they come from, all, all different types of things, and massive variation across people's attitudes to whether they support migration on these different sorts of levels. So a huge nuance on people, uh, in people's, people's views on this that you, you need to understand and unpack, which uh, the observatory will be really well positioned uh, to do. Uh, and in terms of areas, there's two, two quick points on that, is that there's massive variation in people's concern about immigration as a national issue, a local issue, and a personal issue. Um, and it's kind of, uh, the UK is another extreme example of this. So you'll get 70% of people saying that uh, it's a big national issue. You'll get about 25% of people saying it's a local issue. And then just pre-Brexit, there was only 10% of people saying it was an issue to them personally. The immigration was, was a pers having a negative personal impact on them. So you've got this, this massive gradient of uh, concerns depending on the, the level of geography uh, that you're looking at. And that's not at all to dismiss that it's a real concern for people. You can't say that it's made up or it's due to the media as a result of that because people have different different levels of concern about those different things. You can't just dismiss it on the back of that. But it's important to understand that there is those variants. And then, But looking at how it varies by area, the challenge is you need really big sample sizes to look properly at areas or you need to do some quite heroic modelling uh, down to local areas. Uh, and we did have a chance in the UK with the citizenship survey that ran for a while to look at this in more detail. So this is 20 or 30,000 uh, interviews. And, and what that showed was the absolute most worried areas in Britain were asylum dispersal areas, what the Home Office classified as asylum dispersal areas. But the next most worried areas were areas of low migration. Um, uh, so it wasn't about levels of, of migration. That's a kind of classic pattern that we see r when you look more regionally or at uh, a city level. It's actually relatively low uh, migration areas that were most worried about it, but the absolute most worried, uh, and the ones that seem to lead to political impact in terms of support for um, uh, more radical parties, were very homogenous areas quite nearby diverse areas. Um, so that, that when we did some, some modelling on National Front, BNP, and uh, more laterally UKIP uh, voting patterns alongside that, it was actually those homogenous areas that had a sense of threat from more diverse areas that are neighbouring. So it's that sense of how that change is going to impact on them. We were the most areas that, and the ones that led to most kind of political leverage uh, for people. Thank, thank you, Bob. I think there's also research in France looking at support for the Front National, which shows similar effects, okay. similar effects in France as well. So I'm happy to open the floor again for further questions. We immediately have three, four. Oh, five, oh sorry, you had you had to put your hand up the first time. I think I might have missed you. So uh, I might even go for go for. Could you put your hand? I've now lost track of who. Oh, mm -hmm. well, well, we'll we'll take three and then we'll have another round. So we start at the front here. If you could locate your microphone. In the, the I think it's in the in the armrest. In the armrest. <coughs> now, yeah, yeah. Uh, Vit Novotny from the Martin Center in Brussels. Uh, several questions, uh, comments. One is, uh, was wondering whether sometimes. Um, I shared the analysis that Mr. Duffy made about the distinction between the cultural and economic uh, concerns. Uh, I wonder if sometimes uh, a cultural protest is masked as, a, as an economic protest. In, in a way, I'm not allowed to express um, you know, a racist attitude, so I, I, I express it as a, as, a, as a fear for my job. Uh, secondly, I uh, would um, uh, support um, what uh, one of, uh, the speaker said before, the, uh, the religious uh, uh, element in immigration uh, and the concern is, is quite important. There's some recent surveys have looked specifically at um, attitudes to uh, immigration from Muslim countries and the, the, the results were dramatic. Uh, to simplify, I don't want any Muslims in my country. Um, and um, uh, thirdly, uh, just a, maybe a question to, 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 to Ms. Collett here. Um, you mentioned the, the over-focus on um, numbers in the, in the debate, and you suggested there are some other indicators. <coughs> I wonder to what extent those other indicators which 
are valid and perhaps good for policymakers can be actually translated into a political debate where if you, uh, if you have an election uh, fight, it's all about numbers. How can you convey more complexity in that debate? Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, I was going to focus over here and then move across the room. So uh, can you put your hand? I, I lose track of who had the hand up. So would you? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for these presentations. Um, all very interesting. I'm Annalisa Buschini from the Open Society European Policy Institute. Hi. The question uh, related to um, uh, the topic of values as a driver for attitudes uh, on migration. And I, w I was wondering to what extent the different values um, that um, James Dennison spoke about uh, coexist at the individual level, so in, in one individual. And I'm asking that because I'm um, increasingly concerned about the polarization of the debate that we hear. So it's not just uh, us versus them in the sense of indigenous population versus migrants, but also an us versus them in the sense of universalists, let's say, and nativists. Um, and that's the concern that's also reflected in, uh, in um, civil society organizations and I guess also some parties that are trying to shift their discourse to address these concerns of more, let's say, nativists, people that are more uh, driven uh, by, let's say, uh, yes, authoritarianism and nativism. But at the same time, they are afraid to lose, let's say, their basis, their usual consistency. Um, so I'm wondering whether this, this concern is, is um, let's say, justified and well-funded, and also if there is a space for a less polarized discourse, so a discourse that could speak to both sides of our same human uh, nature. I think be, was a, you had a question as well. Sorry, it's be behind you. My microphone fell on the ground. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that could work. So we'll try that approach. Do you want to stand up so that they can get you on the camera as well? <laughs> <laughs> I think I propose that we reverse the order this time. We've come back for a second, uh, 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 another round of questions, so we'll try and keep the responses uh, relatively brief so that we can get another round in. And I'll maybe ask Bobby if he wanted yep. like to respond first. Yeah, I haven't got a lot actually. Andrew. So just on the on the extent to which uh, those attitudes hide underlying racist attitudes in some sense of. Um, uh, or cultural. Co maybe. Co co yeah, yeah. So the the interaction is really difficult to unpick those types of things. I think the, the broad view is that relatively little of that is true racist attitudes. But this, this is one of the most interesting areas, I think, of study. Eric Kaufman, UK, well, uh, Canadian academic uh, in the UK, is looking at um, trying to understand what he's calling cultural self-interest. And the boundaries between cultural self-interest and racism, I don't know, to me, seem really blurred. <laughs> and uh, under, unpicking more of that, uh, what is acceptable levels of cultural self-interest uh, in different situations, I think, is a, is a very rich area, but very difficult to get to, particularly with fairly blunt instruments of survey questions that, that we have. But there's definitely a lot more to, to, to be done there. They understand the interaction between those types of things. What, what, is, uh, what is acceptable self-interest from a cultural perspective and what isn't? 
Sure. I mean, um, I'm contractually obliged to say that um, expertise would be the answer and a more nuanced debate in terms of um, finding different indicators for success and failure, but I'm also given to understand that that would be a bad thing in the public debate. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to fall back on uh, it, really focusing again on real implementation of policy and holding policymakers to account. Did they do what they said they'd do? Did they spend the money they said they'd, say they'd spend? Did they create the reception centres they promised to, 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 to create? Did they do these things? And that has a local and, and, and national dimension, I think. And it's, it's much harder to do and bring into the debate, but we have a tendency towards letting people off the hook in terms of making promises and not following through. Um, I'm trying to think of a good, succinct example. I can't think of one. If I do, I'll come back in the next one of a, a good, succinct example of that. But I think, you, you know, we have to start really thinking about policy follow through. And that's been, I, okay, uh, the European crisis was characterized as a crisis of numbers. Yes, the numbers increased direct, directly, but the crisis is really a crisis of dysfunction. Pre-existing dysfunction in the asylum system was laid bare by an increased number of people. But we have continued to focus on the numbers and not the dysfunction. So we have not resolved the underlying problems. And then we'll be, we're going to end up in this cycle of crisis again and again and again. That's my yeah, very briefly on specifically on this point, I, I, I think there, there are different levels uh, of uh, intervention in a way. I mean, closing this gap between perception and reality is important. It's a, it's a long-term objective. It doesn't w work uh, very quickly. There are huge differences across country into, in terms of uh, um, uh, how people get it right on migration. It's true that people also get it wrong on other questions, not only uh, on immigration. But if you look at, uh, at, at the gap in Sweden, it's much smaller. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a long-term objective. Uh, and, and, and so it's about uh, building the, the evidence and finding ways to convey this evidence and, and expert may, maybe not always the best place to, to do that. Um, but it's also about uh, exactly what we said about the uh, capacity to uh, to be accountable for for policies uh, and for the outcomes of the policies. So indicator of success, yes. But uh, part of this indicator of success is the, uh, I mean, capacity to have a clear vision about what you want to achieve uh, through migration. What, why? Uh, do you have a migration policy? And uh, also, uh, at the same time, be in a position to react quickly to changes, to be flexible in the way you manage policies. So it's not something which is set in stone for forever. And, and so that capacity to hear the concern, be able to adjust the parameters according to the circumstances, but also having a vision uh, is, is necessary. That's, that's what I call leadership, basically. Thank you. On, uh, just to briefly on this question of uh, satisfactory integration, I don't think so much we will be able to say very much about that. I think there are, we, we, we expect to see significant variation across European countries in a debate that takes different colours in different places. I think what we would point to, based on the presentation we've done and the analysis we've done so far, is maybe to look a little bit beyond that. And I think speakers have have mentioned this, that any, any, all of those kind of debates about the perceived effects or outcomes of policy are likely to be strongly affected by uh, some maybe more fundamental drivers of attitudes. And we've talked about trust in political leaders, we've talked about the kind of messaging, but also the kind of trust in, you know, the, the trust in the messenger, the wider trust in political institutions and political leaders to convey those kind of messages. Uh, and I think those are the kinds of issues we want to try to engage with. And, and our, we, we're, we're, we're academic researchers. What we want to do is make available the best possible evidence. And I think there are then people better placed than us to think about how that can be used and, and how forms of engagement can then develop on that basis. So I think the question is an important one, but I think we're probably going to try to do something maybe prior to that in, in, in our work. I'll let James talk briefly about the question on, on values as well. Uh. Yeah, so that was a really interesting question about whether um, the sort of pro-immigration camps could lose their base. I would be rather sceptical of that, 
not least because the fundamentals of immigration in the short term are that they are adding to diversity, essentially, and that they are uh, essentially a more universalist position. Over time, those immigrants do, um, depending on the policies to some extent, but do integrate, and therefore uniformity is naturally restored to some extent. But I don't think there needs to really be any fear that uh, of, of, of losing the base. You also talked about... Um, whether people hold multiple values at the same time. And that's ab absolutely without a doubt. Unless someone was extremely unbalanced, they're going to hold some of these values and these will be motivational goals in their life to some extent. Though as they're laid out in that circle, if you can remember, they are, are actually op theoretically opposite and contradictory. If someone scores, scores high on one, we should expect them to score relatively lower on, on its opposite. But even then, yeah, people, all people will hold uh, to some extent these values and so we can be fairly optimistic in terms of uh, to the extent that different people can be brought together around common endeavors okay we we have time for another round there well maybe two rounds actually because more hands have appeared i will go to the ones that i saw originally start in the middle here and then i'll move across the room so you could uh, if you could introduce yourself as well please thank you uh, my name is Tomasz tetrinovich i come from poland polish office for foreigners it's a governmental body um Congratulations on the project. It's very timely, it's very thorough. Uh, even short browsing shows very interesting and sometimes surprising uh, results. Uh, I'm referring particularly, for example, to uh, the indicators on the hopes for successful integration, which surprisingly uh, in Poland seem bigger than, for example, in Sweden, which is quite, uh, quite a new thing for me, um, especially in the times of uh, such a big polarizations in the in, in the opinions of, of the society. But I'm not going to, in my question, I'm not going to um, go into the direction of uh, analysis of uh, indicators. I would rather ask for uh, about the project development, the past and the future of the project. Could you perhaps share more information about uh, methodologies and um, um, specification of the of the project. How many people were interviewed, uh, how they were interviewed, whether they were computer-based, personal, or uh, um, telephone interviews, in how many countries, and so on. So maybe details which may seem boring to uh, some of us, but uh, for, for, for many may seem uh, relevant uh, as assessing accuracy. Um, second question is whether you are planning updates. If yes, when, and uh, whether the methodology will be the same or there will be some modifications. And uh, Third question concerns uh, the website. It's just a quite a, a rather feedback for the website. It could be useful uh, for the viewer to um, um, have the comparison for data for di from different periods. I'm sure you probably were thinking about it when developing the future uh, updates of the project. And the last question. Uh, it's a rather question for the for Mr. Duffy whether the data you were talking about is available in f from from the source whether we could access uh, the raw data that you have presented. Thank you. And, uh, sorry, behind behind you actually. Sorry, uh, behind you. Sorry. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello, Laurent Jean from uh, the European Commission, DG Home. Um, I'm working on integration. We are very interested in the project and really supporting the OPAM. Uh, we are also considering launching a neurobarometer on integration. So one of the questions we thought about was what people think integration is. So if we ask this question in the final version, it would be interesting for also the OPAM to look at that and to, to check, to cross perhaps with other v um, values. Now, we, we got a lot of uh, questions trying to, to build a questionnaire and partly uh, due to interaction with your, your good team of experts. And one of the questions was whether you use migration in the question, for instance. If you ask people not what they think about migrants, but what they think about people who came abroad for work or for other reasons, whether it changed. I mean, you made very clear that the way you phrase a question has a big impact on the replies. So, I mean, either you, you, you may want to put, to change the words to have more positive or more negative uh, attitudes. So, how do you see that? How do you see the role? 
I mean, do we have an objective question? Do we have more objective? Do you inform respondents before they reply? Uh, for sure, uh, I mean, our Eurobarometer would be about non-EU migration, so we will have to make it very clear in, in the introduction. Now, uh, there is also the choice of questions. So, to questions such as, did migrants make my country better or worse? I mean, I, I could not reply. I think many people would have difficulties and would, in the end, f end up in the middle category. So do you force people to reply by not having a neither positive nor negative? Or do you also have other questions that are more, uh, that are different? Well, you show a lot of variety of questions and some, I think, make more sense than others. And when you ask, do you want less or more migration? Do respondents realize that part of mi migration happens anyway? Uh, so it's not that the, the government has the full <laughs> capacity to decide this number of family migrants, this number of refugees, this number of students. Perhaps the workers is different, but among categories. So you have also this illusion of, of power when you ask this kind of question. Thank you. And then we had a, que a question here. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yes. Uh, Julien Simon from ICMPD. Well, first of all, congratulations about the launch of the OPAM. Uh, we had the pleasure to uh, count among, uh, among us uh, your colleague uh, in Valletta uh, earlier this year to present already what was going to happen. And I'm really glad to see that it's, uh, it's quite impressive work. And we are very much looking forward to uh, the opportunity to working with you um, in, in certain aspects. And one of the aspects that I would like to highlight uh, is the fact that I would argue that when it comes to formulating the question and how it will impact the answer, um, it, it, it all depends on who you ask the question, basically. Let me give you an example. You mentioned the fact that we've been working on the uh, media coverage of migration. Uh, what we did is that we worked with a partner which was able to identify what we could call migration savvy journalists. People who are deemed to know what they are talking about when they cover the issue of migration. So we selected 17 uh, journalists in 17 countries, both in Europe, and we also wanted to know what the opinion in the South. So we had also um, coverage from Northern Africa and the Middle East. What is the interesting thing is that we asked them to look into how the media covered the issue of migration in their respective countries and brought the, the spectrum of, of media during the period 2015-2016. Every single one of these migration savvy journalists have narrowed down their own assignment to covering the issue of irregular, illegal, and or irregular migration, immigration. So one thing that I would like to know is whether the OPAM, focusing on migration, is also going to look into, because what we've been discussing here is mostly about the issue of immigration, whether you're also going to look into the issue of emigration, which unfortunately uh, has basically more or less disappeared from the understanding of what migration is all about. And I think that when we talk about the narrative of migration, this is one of the biggest shortcomings. We have forgotten, basically, that emigration, our own history of immigration, and in this regard, the European diaspora, which, by the way, we are not supposed to call diaspora, because that's a term which should not apply to the Europeans, apparently, when you talk to certain specialists, uh, it's expatriates, much, uh, much better to use this term, uh, basically, is, um, has disappeared from the, world, uh, from the world discussion. Let me give you just one, one example in this regard, and I think it's important that uh, you look into, in, into this aspect. We were told by journalists from a very, uh, like, let's say, um, central, let's say, mainstream media from an Eastern European country country was telling us that they received the editorial instruction no longer to use the term migrants to describe their own population abroad because that was a term which was no longer to be used to describe their own population. It was for the others, basically. So I think it is very important that uh, maybe OPAM looks into this direction as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we, we have a fourth question at the back, uh, if you've got the microphone. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Ovidu Simina, European Security and Ethics College. Uh, I, was, I would like to, uh, to ask you in which uh, way the migration security nexus is covered by the research or if you intend to focus on this in the future. We will have a, tra a specific training on the migration crisis and the body management uh, next year and we will be interested in 
such research. Thank you. Well, maybe if I could just on a, just I'm just going to start on because we had some questions from our, our colleague from Poland in terms of the, the, what actually we're doing, and I apologise if we've given any misunderstanding. We are gathering existing survey data. So uh, you know, the European Social Survey, Eurobarometer data that Ipsos have shared with us, transatlantic trends. We are gathering existing data and organising that within the resource. So we, we, we haven't conducted surveys ourselves. We'd like to do that. But at the moment, just to gather all the data that is out there and organise it in the way that you have seen. Updates, this will be constantly updated. This is a resource that has been created and will be updated as new sources, new information become available. And our ambition is also to expand the coverage. Uh, we, we, uh, Ipsos and other organisations have data which allow us to think globally because we think that attitudes to Europe can be compared with attitudes to countries outside Europe and in very interesting ways, as we've already seen. Uh, and you also asked a question about our website. Uh, well, and, and, and the gathering of data for different peers. Well, there is data on there looking change over time, and obviously we want to develop the resource. So hopefully that helps with, with those questions. Uh, so, I, I, and maybe now, James, do you want to address some points? Uh, just on Thomas's question about the DAISY, I, I really just echo what Andrew says, although we are gathering not just the sort of common pan-European things, but, um, but from, from national country surveys and then also <coughs> professors are giving us some of their data as well. On Laurent's point on uh, the Eurobarometer, what kind of question we should put in and the phrases we should use, that really just depends entirely on, um, I should say that I've, I haven't quite responded to his email yet asking this question from before, so, and I said I would, but that depends on exactly what you're looking for. That depends on the sort of question that you, that, uh, the information you want to find out and why. Of course, the way you phrase it will uh, affect the answer. Um, but, I mean, we can talk in more detail, but the question you ask should just most closely reflect the information you want to find out. And then, uh, Julian, I think it was, on the last question, which was on uh, emigration. Uh, that was something we would like to look at in the future. The, f the next year, we're going to be looking at Europe primarily, and then in the longer term, we'll be looking at global attitudes to immigration, and then there especially, we'll look at uh, emigration as well. Could I say? But also, this is your observatory of public attitudes to migration, not yeah. immigration. Uh, so I think it, the point you make is very important. And for us, this is a developmental meeting. We're getting ideas, comments, suggestions, things we should be looking at. And I think that's a, a very important point. It's, this is an observatory of attitudes to immigration. Bobby? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're about. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> miles away there. Um, so, yeah, on, on questionnaire approach. So, we could talk for hours about questionnaire design mm. stuff. We'd love, we'd love doing that. Um, I think the, the general point I would observe is that the most interesting and insightful studies that you see in, in questionnaire, because of the challenges you're talking about, about framing, are the experimental designs where you are split sampling and trying different treatments with representative groups of the public at the same time, where you can vary conditions to actually then understand what are the key things and triggers that change attitudes or give you a different picture of attitudes. And there's, there's lots and lots of great work that's looked at how the different framings uh, change views. And that, in a sense, is, is one of the most direct ways to understand what is really driving underlying attitudes on those type of things. So I, I would, it, there's lots, lots more specific detail you could go into on what sort, how do you do that? But the general principle of if you have facility to use experimental designs to vary conditions, uh, that will give you so much more depth of understanding of what's really important to people when, when, you, when you get to those things. And one aspect of that is information provision. One aspect of the things that you can vary is information provision. And, and I'm actually, I'm just uh, midway through a book on our broader, uh, writing a book on our broader study of misperceptions, which is um, what drives people's misperceptions, and not just of immigration, but of all sorts of attitudes, uh, Muslim populations, teenage pregnancy, uh, unemployment levels, et cetera, et cetera. People, these uh, misperceptions about social realities that people have. And so we've been looking a lot at the extent to which information provision shifts views. And you can find very, very varied evidence out there about whether it shifts views or not. 
Um, some will say, I think Jean-Christophe Jean or Elizabeth were, were mentioning one that does show from transatlantic trends that you can uh, change people's attitudes within the survey instrument by information provision to some degree. There's some new work that's come out relatively recently that shows that there is some stickiness to that, that they went back to the same people four weeks later and people still had slightly different uh, views as a result of that. That's one of the key questions, the extent to which actually uh, this decays over time. You introduce some information to people, but then do people snap back to their underlying values, as, as James has uh, kind of outlined. And understanding that, it's not just can you just shift a view within a, a survey instrument, which is a very artificial thing. It's what do people take back to their real lives and what lasts over time. And I think there's lots more that can be done to understand how fact provision decays over time and people move back to that underlying value. So I think that that would be a really interesting thing to look at more. Okay. Yeah, just, just a, uh, um, a follow-up re reflection based on, on your remark on, on immigration. I think, uh, maybe it's my ignorance, but there has been uh, little work on the relationship between immigration and the, the perception uh, towards immigration. And uh, it's, it's fair to say that some, you know, uh, uh, old immigration countries uh, in Southern Europe, but uh, some other countries uh, have uh, less, uh, uh, let's say, prominent uh, far-right parties. Obviously, this is due to historical reasons and some other factors. But maybe there is an interesting point here in looking at the connection between the dynamic of the immigration and the perception of immigration in, in the country, and, and that might be one way to, to address that question in, in, in the OPAMA. At least I think this is interesting because in Europe, we can see in the eastern part of Europe, these are also large immigration countries currently, and countries which are uh, very sensitive on migration topics right now. Maybe that would worth some further investigation. Okay, I think, I think we've unfortunately run out of time, uh, but we can carry on this discussion outside of the meeting room because we'd like, we uh, would like to invite you for uh, a lunch which is in, uh, in the foyer. What I'd like to do also is uh, thank the speakers, but also thank uh, Aurélie Borsier and Justina Ragolite from the Migration Policy Centre who played a big role in administering this event and bringing it all together. They've, they've done a fantastic job. I'd also say that there are, with, uh, there are still some of the OPAM bags on the chair. They are the ideal gift uh, for, for, for loved ones or people you're not particularly enthusiastic about, but the, uh, the OPAM bag is the gift for all occasions. Please feel free to take those OPAM bags and spread the word. And, uh, first, and finally, and, and certainly not, not as an afterthought, I'd like to thank our panelists, Jean-Christophe, Elizabeth and uh, Bobby, who've made a, a really fascinating contribution and we're very grateful to them for, for sparing the time to be with us today. So, so thank you to them. Thank you.